let us move on to Dr. Kevin Vigilante. Dr. Vigilante is a medical doctor practicing at Brown University's Miriam Hospital. He has traveled extensively to the Sudan where he has secretly filmed slave encampments and interviewed former slaves. Dr. Vigilante. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, I'll briefly recount my experience in the Sudan um, about 12 months ago. I went to the Sudan with uh, several objectives. One was to evaluate medical conditions there in certain uh, situations. Two, to uh, investigate reports of slavery. And three, to investigate uh, reports of the mass abduction and forced incarceration of black African children. Um, <clears throat> I traveled there um, and took with me a um, very small square video camera. It almost looked like a 35 millimeter. And um, you know, you're not supposed to take pictures in the Sudan without a uh, special photographic permit. Um, and so I um, used this video camera um, somewhat surreptitiously to interview um, children who had escaped from slavery parents who had children who escaped uh, and other people who were knowledgeable on this subject, including uh, members of international NGOs living there, uh, clergy, and I even spoke to some members of the government, but of course uh, did not video them. Um, <clears throat> I learned that there are basically three types of slavery extant in the Sudan. Uh, the first type grows out of a centuries-old tradition of slavery um, coming out of intertribal warfare. Um, most recently, however, particularly in the 80s, uh, the government chose to arm um, Arab tribes in their war against the black African tribes, uh, particularly the Dinka. Uh, and they, in this particular case, they're arming the Begara tribe. And um, they encouraged this conflict and also encouraged the, um, to the, the there was no reprisal for uh, the booties of war, including the capture and enslavement of children from the Dinka tribe, which happened in very, very large numbers. Um, the Bagara so armed were called the, the Murahalin, and there is a network of slavery that comes out of this particular uh, uh, methodology. There's a second <coughs> mode of slavery that um, comes more directly from government forces particularly the Popular Defense Force. The Popular Defense Force is, is, is a sort of a non-professional, irregular army that's ideologically based. They are the warriors in the jihad. The warriors are called the Mujahideen as opposed to Murahalin. Uh, the, uh, they are engaged in the jihad, the war in the south. And the, the Mujahideen of the PDF are generally paid poorly or, or not at all. And they are uh, permitted, if not encouraged, to keep the, um, the spoils of war as part of their compensation. And the spoils of war may indeed include other human beings, particularly children. Uh, one illustrative case, uh, there's a train, a supply train that goes from Baba Nusa to Wow. Wow is a city deep in the south, it's a supply train. And this train um, goes very, very slowly, a couple of miles a day, really. And uh, hordes of PDF soldiers will be on either side of the train in horseback, ostensibly to protect the train. However, what actually happens is the PDF soldiers um, fan out into the countryside, raid villages, uh, keep cattle and children, load them on the train, and when the train gets to wow, they have their booty. Um, and these children are then, um, may often go back to the families of these warriors who may be living in the north. Um, and I spoke to a number of children who escaped from uh, uh, such capture. Um, the third is a type of slavery that I, mean, I think is a legitimate form of slavery. It involves the uh, mass abduction of children in the streets. Uh, in the streets of Khartoum, of course, there are many uh, displaced kids, homeless kids, but there are also kids who are, have parents, and uh, like your children. Um, and uh, these children may be rounded up en masse um, in, in raids called kashas. A kasha is a raid. And typically a, uh, a, tr a truck with a canvas 
covering on it will pull up into a street or a city square and uh, soldiers will come out and round up whatever children are, are there. And I spoke to such chil some children who were so rounded up and that some had just been going out to buy tomatoes for their mother or whatever, shopping in the market, and were taken away. These kids are then um, taken to camps, that many of which are in very remote areas, way, way out in the desert, uh, not near anything at all. And a uh, typical story there is that a child uh, will be given a new name, uh, stripped of his old name, uh, basically a new identity, um, and then undergo forced Islamization um, and be given a new cultural identity, really. They're really, in a sense, cultural cleansing camps to, to, to strip these kids of their identities. Now, the real concern, I mean, this is, this isn't bad enough because these kids will never see their parents again except in some extraordinary circumstances. Um, there are real concerns that these kids are being then used um, as cannon fodder, you know, to be sent to the war in the South to fight uh, in the front on the battle because there is a, there is a tremendous need for manpower in that war. Uh, El-Bashir has uh, committed himself to a million-man army. Um, do these kids go to the South? Uh, there are multiple reports of this. I think that requires uh, uh, further substantiation. I, uh, I uh, managed to visit such a camp. My last day in the Sudan, um, I, uh, after really not getting anywhere with government agencies and officials, I sort of I had approximate coordinates of a camp um, in um, in Wad Medani, near near Wad Medani, way out in the, about 400 kilometers out in the desert, and I rented a car and a driver. And uh, we drove out there and uh, sort of by luck found this camp uh, in the middle of nowhere, um, huts without any sort of facilities at all, and it was empty. Uh, but two armed guards came out to meet us and um, after a while gained their confidence and spoke to them. They're wearing army uniforms. And they corroborated the story that there were indeed uh, 228 kids there up until September 9th before that, when these kids were moved away. Where these kids went, um, I don't know. Uh, they didn't know. Um, of course, the, the greatest concern is that they might have been sent to the front. I mean, uh, but that's, that's, that's unknown. They disappeared. So uh, I think that, and I think this qualifies for a form of slavery. I mean, the kids are being abducted and forced into an environment that's against their will and they'll never see their parents again and given new identities and maybe being shipped off to war. This is a very grave uh, situation. Um, that's what I saw. Um, now, just a word about um, the response that you will hear. You will hear the response that, well, because these kids typically are, are, are black African Southerners. And you'll hear people say from the Sudan, particularly the Northerners, say, well, listen, we're all black. Look at our skins. We're dark. See, I'm darker than you. And um, that's true. In fact, the Sudan is remarkable for its, its racial heterogene heterogeneity. The Nile River produces a tremendous mixing of genes, and so you'll f find an imperceptible uh, gradation of color from light skin to dark um, throughout the uh, Sudan. However, I must say that uh, there is also a hierarchy of class and culture based on uh, skin and tribal, s tones of skin color and tribal associations. And, um, you know, I'm uh, at, the, at the extremes, it's very clear into which camp somebody falls. You know, I was, I'm a white guy from Rhode Island, and I wasn't there very long before I could easily pick out, you know, a, a Dinka or a or a, or a Shilluk or a Newer, as opposed to somebody from the South. So these, if such, such differentiations were transparent to me, um, it's easy to see how they'd be transparent to other people there and used as a method of uh, discrimination and enslavement. Um, it's a, Sudan is a tragic place. It's been at war for most of this century in one way or the other. But I must say it's, it's made even more tragic because the Sudanese are among it's really uh, paradoxical. They're the most, among the most uh, gentle and uh, uh, accommodating people that I've met in many travels. So uh, I just hope that uh, someday the Sudan will find its way to freedom. Thank you.